Thanks for joining me tonight. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we all come to this session, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I then introduce myself. All of my contact details are on the left-hand side. I am at RISL on Twitter. I am Auslit Teacher on all of the other pipes. So uh, if you go to Auslit Teacher on Instagram, I share mentor tech suggestions on there. And then uh, I also run the Auslit Teacher website where I do a weekly blog, talk about all things literacy and education. On the right-hand side, they're the books that I'm currently reading. And I did ask for you in the chat if you could share any class novels that you are currently reading to your F to 2 students. So I've got the picture of Sally Rippon's book, Polly and Buster, on the right-hand side. It's one of the books that I've been reading uh, because I've set myself this challenge of finding Australian, i.e. amazing authors that we have in Australia. So I'm trying to find Australian texts that are fantastic class novels for the F to 2 classroom. So if you have any, I would love to see your suggestions in the chat. I recently recommended Margin Charge and I've been so pleased to see how many classrooms are reading that now. Polly and Buster is my next recommendation. And last night I started reading Glenda Millard's uh, The Naming of Tishkin Silk. So I'll let you know how that one goes. Where are we in the web webinar series? We're up to number three. We're up to speaking and listening. This is my favourite. Well, I think it's my favourite. Writing and speaking and listening are my favourites. This, I am so passionate about this topic because we don't talk about it enough in schools and the talk that we do isn't, I, th I don't think it's quite hitting the mark. So I'm really thrilled that I get to talk about it with you tonight uh, for one and a half hours. The link to the chat, I can see a few of you in the chat now, so great to see you in there. It's really important for you to, to, to join the chat and uh, you know, put your thoughts into the conversation because we want to make this as interactive as possible. So uh, the chat link up there is tinyurl.com, then a bunch of numbers and letters. If you're joining the recording of this session on YouTube after the event, then on the right-hand side, I've put a picture of the FUSE website, the department's FUSE website. And if you search on there for the F2 webinar series, you'll have access to all of the uh, supporting resources and... Uh, any of the slides and the recordings for the sessions. So you won't need to um, worry about not having access to the resources. So all of the previous webinars are on there as well, which is such a great idea. Thank you to Talia for organising that for us. Okay, so I asked before, uh, <laughs> before the slide issue, I asked why do you think speaking and listening is the poor cousin of the literacy suite? Do you agree with that? Uh, and if so, why do you think we've come to that? Uh, and so here, here's my thinking or some of my thinking on the reasoning for that. So the first is I'd say, or the, well, the, I guess the first one's not a reason. It's evidence that it's not, uh, that it is the poor cousin is that it's not prioritised in our curriculum. It's not prioritised in our timetables generally. One of the reasons for that is I don't think we've had a lot of teacher professional development in speaking and listening Certainly not to the extent of uh, reading and writing. It'd be so lovely if we could say that, yeah, I've had an even dose of professional development in each of those areas. So uh, I think one of the outcomes of not having professional development in speaking and listening is that we, we lose confidence uh, and we don't have a full understanding of what, what are the requirements for speaking and listening. What does good speaking and listening look like? So uh, I think that's one of the things. Misunderstanding about what it is in the curriculum. And this is evident when you get to report writing time and magically everyone in your classroom gets a C. You get a C, you get a C, and you get a C. Uh, no other area does that happen. That All of a sudden we just magically line up. So this is usually because we, as a teacher, we, we don't feel confident to know well, I don't know if they've got a C or they're worthy of a B or an A. It's because I don't really know what goes into speaking and listening. The other thing that can happen at report writing time is we think, oh, my goodness, I haven't done any teaching for speaking and listening. Quick, everyone has to do a presentation. I'm going to sit here and mark you all. So presentational talk is one aspect of the curriculum, but it's not the whole speaking and listening curriculum. So I'm hoping to convince you of that by the end of tonight. Another reason that I think it could be uh, the poor cousin is because there isn't a standardised test. So 
You know what I'm talking about, guys. Don't make me say the word, all right? You know what I'm talking about? So this, because it isn't, there is no standardised test for this, then we don't sort of feel that pressure to have to uh, be making sure that we're including it in the curriculum. I think one of the other offshoots, because there isn't a standardised test, maybe we forget the value of speaking and listening and it starts to uh, fade off into the distance. So we don't understand the impact of speaking and listening on those things that are in the standardised assessments. And then the last stop point I've put there, which I see you guys adding some to the chat now, is it's hard to assess. And I do get a lot of emails from people saying, oh, have you got any speaking and listening assessments? Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. What does speaking and listening look like? And you'll have a much better idea about what's an effective assessment, what's not, hopefully, by the end of this. All right, so the agenda for tonight is I'm going to start by talking about what speaking and listening looks like in the curriculum and how often do we ever get to talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about the how. So what are some teaching practices that you can engage in to promote effective speaking in the classroom? What are some teaching practices you can engage in to promote effective listening in the classroom? Some of those lessons probably need to happen in my own house. Uh, and the last one is vocabulary. We'll do a little snippet on vocabulary. We won't have a lot of time on that one. So my understanding goals for this session, you will build your understanding of the theory that underpins instruction in speaking, listening and vocabulary. So I always say reasons before results. If you don't understand the why for something, you'll go and use the practical part of it and but then it'll fizzle out because, you know, you'll get over the, the fun of it and if you don't deeply understand the why of it, you won't continue with the practice. So I always make sure to include some theory and research first. You will deepen your understanding of a range of effective teaching practices. That's the practical. That's what we're all here for. So that's the second part. And the third is that you will reflect on your own teaching practices. So just to think, okay, well, how am I going with this? What are the small tweaks that I could make in my own practice? So the success criteria, you'll be able to or hopefully outline the speaking and, and, sorry about the missing D, listening expectations of students in F2. You'll be able to identify some teaching practices and you'll be able to reflect on your own practice. So we'll keep it pretty simple, all right? Okay, so the what of speaking and listening. I'm going to take you to the Victorian curriculum and I think... I sort of view this as a luxury because we don't ever get to sit down and really learn and think and discuss what is even in the curriculum for speaking and, li speaking and listening. So let's start by looking at dividing the Victorian curriculum up. Uh, and so contrary to popular belief, you'll realise that show and tell isn't the only part of speaking and listening in the curriculum, but we'll get to that. So there are several parts to the speaking and listening curriculum. Uh, and I'm just going to take you through the three strands quickly. The first one is language. So students develop their knowledge of the English language and how it works. So basically we're on about syntax here. You know, what, what sounds right. Uh, and of course this has obvious flow on uh, effects for reading. So here we're talking about phonics. We're talking about word knowledge as well as syntax. If you can't say it, you can't write it. All right. The second part or second strand is literature, mm, talking about books. So we're in the speaking and listening, but we're actually talking about books. So in here, this is responding to texts. This is providing a viewpoint on texts. Uh, it's creating texts. So engages students in the study of literary texts uh, of personal, cultural, social and aesthetic value. So actually speaking about text is a part of the speaking and listening curriculum. Who knew? <laughs> now, the third strand is literacy. So in here, this aims to develop students' ability to interpret and create texts, uh, talking about confidence, fluency, efficacy for learning in and out of school and just for participating in the real world. So here, we're talking about interacting with others. We're talking about having conversations, dialogue. Uh, and yes, a part of this is giving presentations. But even just by looking at these three strands, you can see this is a lot broader than what we've been selling it as uh, in the past. This is, it's so much bigger than just giving presentations. So uh, yes, presentation is one part, 
But that dialogue, that discussion, that even the syntax knowledge, we've got to be taking all of that into account as well. So my own personal belief is that if we, it makes sense that we're going to join the literacy strand, the conversations, with the literature strand where we're talking about books. So let's focus most of our energy there. The language strand, we're actually going to have a webinar in future on phonological awareness, so we'll talk a bit more about that then. But tonight, we're going to really focus in on uh, talk, having those rich conversations about texts. Now, just to give you some perspective on where we're taking the students in primary school, in, in terms of these rich conversations about texts, what are the expectations? So by the time your students graduate year six in your school, this is what they're required to know and do in terms of speaking and listening. And the reason I want to bring this to your attention is because if this is what they're supposed to be able to do by the end of year six, we've got to work backwards from there. We've got to start building these skills from foundation. And let me read some of them out because it's quite dense. Participate in and contribute to discussions. We're clarifying, we're interrogating ideas developing and supporting arguments. We're sharing information. We're evaluating information. We're sharing and evaluating experiences, opinions. And then we're using all the interaction skills, you know, the, the little cues and how do I know when I'm speaking or when you're speaking, all of those types of things. There's a lot in that. That's not something we're going to be able to teach in one year. So I've got a backwards track. Start that in foundation. The other part of the year six one Participate in formal and informal debates. Plan, rehearse and deliver presentations. So again, these are skills that we need to start building right back in foundation. It's a pretty lofty goal, but you could, I think you can absolutely see if our students achieve this, it's, they're going to go out and be more contributing members of, of our broader society. So these are really important skills. We cannot leave them up to chance. Now, what I'm going to do in the supporting resources pack that hopefully you have downloaded, I've included uh, three examples of the curriculum. So I've put in there the A to F expectations for speaking and listening. I've put in there the F to 2 expectations. And I've also put in there the EAL expectations for A1 and A2. So what I want you to do is to select the curriculum that is most relevant for you and your students and I want you to read through what are the expectations from F to 2 uh, in terms of speaking and listening. And in the chat, I would like to, you to let us know what do you notice and what do you wonder about these expectations? So I'm going to put my timer on for three minutes. This is three luxurious minutes just to look at the curriculum to see what are the expectations, where are the goalposts in terms of speaking and listening in the classroom. All right, I'll start my timer and I'll be looking forward to your ideas in the chat.
Okay. I know three minutes is really quick, but it is good to see the people who have, who have contributed to the Padlet, your questions and the things that you noticed. So uh, hopefully you can see this. It's quite broad, I think, and hopefully not overwhelming. Uh, I noticed a couple of you have said that there are things that are done daily in the classroom on most instances. And yes, they can be. But I think what I want to really reiterate tonight is that we need to be more intentional about that. So not leaving speaking and listening up to chance, but being more planned and more intentional and more robust about what we're doing in the classroom. Because sometimes we can get into the habit of just assuming that how I teach speaking and listening in my class, well, surely that's just how everyone else is doing it. So, and that's when we start to get, you know, imbalances uh, between classrooms. So we want consistency across the whole school and the state uh, so that all of our students are getting the highest quality of instruction in speaking and listening. Okay, let's get to the how. Uh, the how of speaking. Oh, this is, I'll try not to go on for too long about this, but this is, this is my uh, super passion because I think this is, it pays enormous dividends if you invest time and energy into this work on speaking and, and building the student's capacity to engage in speaking and having deep and rich conversations, it'll pay enormous dividends in all areas of their learning and as human beings out in the world. So when it comes to student talk, it's not surprising that to learn language, we need to use language, okay? So uh, Singer says, daily opportunities to discuss academic ideas are essential for building academic language. And we know from loads and loads of research, academic language leads to academic success. And those students who don't have access to that language are the ones who don't have that success in education. Now, this is an American uh, author, so they've called them uh, English learners, so our equivalent EAL learners, or I like to term them uh, emergent bilinguals because I think it helps us to reframe our thinking as, oh my goodness, these kids are really talented. They're learning more than one language. So ELs need daily opportunities to take risks with language, make mistakes and learn from the valuable feedback of real world communication. And the reason I've shared this quote is because, well, we know that effective instruction for EAL students or emerging bilingual students is effective as instruction for all students. So I'm starting with these two comment or this, this quote and, and the quote, quote I'm about to show you because I just want to, you know, provide that why for uh, this, why do we need to spend time on teaching talk to our students. My challenge for you is to never, ever get through a mini lesson without having every student having spoken in your class. This is so important, particularly in the F2 area. I uh, have the very fortunate position of observe, doing observations in lots of classrooms in lots of schools across the state. And this is probably one of the things that I work on the most. That is that we can't have students getting through a mini lesson without having spoken. And the reason for that is because when you have to speak, you have to think. So if we are getting, if our kids are getting through a whole mini lesson or indeed a whole literacy lesson without having spoken, there's a chance that we haven't put them into that space where they've actually had to really deeply think about something. So the second quote I want to share for you, with you, conversations are powerful teachers. They engage, motivate and challenge. They help us build ideas, solve problems and communicate our thoughts. Now, don't they sound like skills you're going to need out in the real world? They cause ideas to stick and grow in our minds. Oh, I love, you could, you could imagine the visual of that. You know, I think like a strip of Velcro in there. So conversations cause ideas to stick in our minds. They strengthen our comprehension of new ideas. And when we're talking about, you know, we don't have to be talking about text. When we're talking content areas, if we're having conversations, it's strengthening our understanding of what it is that we're learning. So here tonight, I want to talk to you about how we get to those, those rich and meaningful conversations that do cause ideas to stick and grow in our mind. So uh, thinking about 
that talk that enables our students to develop their comprehension uh, in all areas of the curriculum, and really that rich and meaningful talk about texts. So where can we go for resources? Well, fortunately, Literacy Teaching Toolkit, which has been readily available, well, it's been online for a couple of years now, open 24-7. Lots of resources on here for speaking and listening. And you'll see there's a whole bunch of different names. Some people refer to it as accountable talk, substantive talk. They all have little nuances. But really, we're just talking about rich conversations, okay? So you can go on here and access some of the resources, some of the research as well for each of these. Uh, and we're really, they're all on about rich conversations. And we're going to talk about that in this session. Okay, if you thought you were getting through a session with me without listening to the graduate release of responsibility, wrong. <laughs> here it is. Now, the reason I've put this up there is because this, you know, when we're talking about the poor cousin of literacy, we, you know, we abide by this for reading. We're getting our head around this for writing and then speaking, listening, shh, throw it out the window, totally forget about the gradual release of responsibility. I, th I think because we probably, oh, well, I don't know, maybe we assume that, well, everyone can speak, everyone can listen, we don't really need to, you know, do all of that four phases rubbish that Fisher and Fry are on about. We do. We actually need to explicitly teach the skills involved in speaking and in listening and in vocabulary. So particularly uh, the top rung here, the I do it, the modelling phase. You know, think about how often have we explicitly modelled or demonstrated what good speaking looks like, what good conversation looks like or what good listening looks like. So I've put this up here just as a reminder to think, ooh, have I really been, you know, thinking about the gradual release of responsibility in terms of speaking and listening? This, I would say, too, and especially for speaking and listening, you've got to think about in, the, in our homes now, not all of our students are coming with effective models of effective conversations. How do I start a conversation with someone? How do I have a challenging conversation? How do I disagree with someone? So what are the models that our students have and if we aren't modelling it, where are we expecting them to see this modelled, okay? So how do we model this to our students? How do we teach to our students? Uh, Zweiers and Hamler, Zweiers has written a lot about around academic talk and uh, they have a book for K to 3 classrooms or um, F to 3 classrooms and they recommend the best way to teach students in F to 3 classrooms about talk is in partner work. So they say that if, we, uh, if students get into groups larger than two, then uh, it starts to be a bit more confusing for them. If we get, put them into groups of two, then it's only one person they have to have eye contact with and one person they have to focus on. It's, it, you know, it makes sense. So uh, here they said paired conversations increase student talk in a lesson. At any given moment, around half the students are producing language and half are listening and trying to comprehend input. So we've got that expressive language, the people producing it, and that receptive language, that's the one coming back in. So at any given time, if we're doing partner work, my favourite, turn and talk, we've got half the kids do it, you know, practising expressive and half practising receptive language. So when I'm talking to you about not getting through a mini lesson without having everyone spoken, one turn and talk fixes that problem, just one. That's all I'm asking for, everyone. Let's start with one. Okay, I'm going to show you a video now, uh, two actually. Uh, this one is the Think Pair Share Discussion Protocol. It's not new. It's I'm sure you're already well aware of it. But I just want you to look at this video and I want you to think what has the teacher set up to enable success for this protocol in her classroom? You know, what's the teaching that's gone on before this lesson has been filmed? Uh, and as you'll see, there are a couple of aspiring actors on here who are probably just at the start of their acting career. So you'll have to give, give a little bit of, uh, you know, be kind. So uh, what, what are the things that the teachers put in place to enable success for this? Let's have a watch. Iris, my love, I have some news to tell you. I'm going to have a baby. Turn to your partner in three. Two, one. 
Think Pair Share is a simple and quick and fun way for everyone to get a chance to talk. If this is a new activity in your classroom, it's a good idea to practice with the easy question first. Before we start with the story, Iris and Walter and Baby Rose, you're gonna get a chance to do the think, pair, share with your partner. So remember how we've been talking, that's about- Here are those steps to think, pair, share. Talk to your partner. First, you think about the question. What is your favorite thing to do at school? When you know your answer, put your thumb on your knee. So then you pair up with the partner. It's a good idea to repeat the question. My favorite thing to do at school math. And remember, each person gets a turn. Um, recess and lunch. OK, so we thought about it. We talked to our partner. Who wants to share one thing? Finally, you share out and talk about it as a whole class. Um, Armani? Mine is free choice. So my favorite thing to do is? My favorite thing to do is free choice. Kay and I's back on me, a nice job. Now that you practiced and you are ready to think, pair, share about what you're reading and learning about, make sure the teacher reads the question aloud the first. The question you're gonna be thinking about is, how does Iris feel about having a baby sister at the beginning of the story? I'm gonna be a big sister, Iris shouted. We'll get to push the baby in a carriage. We'll feed it a bottle. It will be just like playing doll. I want you to think. How does Iris feel about having a baby sister when you know, thumb on your knee? And remember, be specific. <laughs> Tell me some exact things that happen in the book that let you know. Thumb on your knee when you have your answer. We're gonna start with partner B this time. So turn in three, two, one, knee to knee, eye to eye. She feel happy because then they're gonna be able to feel. And the beginning, she is very, very happy with because the baby is coming. Okay, and come back to me and sparkles. Okay, hands back in your lap. After talking with the partner, the whole class gets to share their thinking together. How is Iris feeling about having a baby at the beginning of this story? Kevante, I heard you and Ronald talking about it. Can you tell me in a nice loud voice? She felt like she was really excited about the baby because she got to feed bottles to her. So I love how I heard Kevante use a specific um, example from the book. She was excited. She's excited about feeding bottles. See how easy it is to get everybody thinking about and sharing their ideas? Rightio. As you can see, aspiring actors in the making there, but that's okay, they'll, they'll go far. Now, I love that video because there are so many things for, for you to take away, and it's probably a video you need to watch multiple times. Uh, you know, Think, Pair, Share, I think we can, we, we know about it, and then we sort of put it in our pocket, and then we forget about it. So one of the really important parts of the Think, Pair, Share is the think giving that time for kids to think, what, do, what is my answer to that? What do I actually wonder about that before we launch into that pair and then the share? So uh, I'd love to see your thoughts in the chat about the protocols or what the teacher has set up to enable that to happen in her classroom. All right, so we're going to watch one more protocol now. This is back to back, same classroom. And again, I want you to think about what's been set up to enable these students to have success with using this discussion protocol. Let's take a look. Snakes have existed for about 125 million years. Throughout history, some people have believed snakes have special... Everybody knows that school is more fun and students get to move around the room and use their bodies and talk to each other about what they are thinking and reading about. Back-to-back, face-to-face is a great way to do that. Three, two, one. I think snakes live in Australia, Africa, Asia. Okay, so I'm going to look for two volunteers who are going to help, and they're going to go in the middle in the fishbowl. Everybody is going to have their eyes on it. It's a good idea to go over how to be safe and what the steps are in back-to-back, face-to-face. The first step is to find your partner and stand back-to-back. The second step is listen to the question. What is question. your favorite thing to do in the summer? And this is really important. Think about your answer. The third step is to turn face-to-face. Three, two, one. The fourth step is sharing, taking turns and speaking and listening. Mine is right at my bike. And the fifth step is to turn back nice to back. Nice job. Okay, let's give them a quick round of applause. If this is a new activity in your classroom, it's a good idea to practice with an easy question first. What is one pet you would like your mom to buy you? Still quiet? Thumbs up by your heart when you know? 
In three, two, one. I want a pet snake and a king kong snake. We might even talk about what worked and what didn't work to make sure everybody is ready. What is one thing you thought we did well when we were doing the back-to-back face-to-face? -face? When I was with my partner Maya, I just asked her, do you want to go first when you didn't tell us who to go first? So then she just went and then I went. Then you're ready to give it a try. How do people affect snakes? Some people hunt snakes for their beautiful skins. The skins are used to make many items such as belts, purses, and shoes. So we're thinking right now. Giving students think time really helps with learning. Let's think about this question. How do people affect snakes? So how does what people do affect snakes? So listen, Claire, stand right back up. Show us back to back with your reading partner. When you know, show me with a thumb by your heart. Three, two, one, turn. Because they kill them and then they use it for their adults. And my grandma has a wall that has like, like a corn snake skin too. Let's remember the five steps to back to back, face to face. Okay, so you can see in that classroom, the teacher has done a lot of work setting up that protocol. And the purpose of that is, if you invest time and energy in setting up the protocol, then it'll pay dividends in saved time in the future when you call on the protocol. So some of the supports that you might have seen in that video were that they'd created an anchor chart about the steps of, you know, that occur in the process, whether it be think, pair, share, or the back to back. Uh, some of the other supports were that they had allocated talk partners, so that's something that you could trial. Uh, it does sometimes that does actually save time, especially if they're already sitting next to them on the floor. Because uh, I have seen observed in classrooms where the teacher will say, "Okay, everyone, turn and talk," and you know some kids will just be like, "Oh, I better wander over to this, the other side of the room to go and choose someone to talk to." So that isn't supposed to take time. That is supposed to be a quick turn to the person next to you, whoever's sitting there, bam, they're your partner. Let's just talk. Uh, another important part about that process a teacher went through is at the end of the conversation, she reflected on the actual conversation, on the, on the skills. So uh, not necessarily on the content of the conversation, but just thinking about how do we go following the protocol? You know, what did it enable you to do? So pulling yourselves out of the, um, the content and looking at the speaking and listening and being really explicit about what that looks like, what effective speaking and listening looks like. So I think these are some of the things that we can just drip into our, um, in, into our literacy classrooms to easily assure ourselves that we've not got a single child getting through a lesson without speaking in our class. Because as you can see, and someone put it in the chat, the person doing the work is doing the learning. So if it's us up the front doing all of the talk, we're the ones doing the learning. We want to, the kids to have to think in that lesson. The other part about that is, and we'll talk a little bit about this more, that you get to listen to their conversations and that is the best data that you can learn so much about what your kids know about the curriculum, about the world and about having, a, you know, about speaking and listening through using your two ears as they're all engaged in their conversations. So if you set up those strong protocols, then the work gets, they spend all of the time on the actual task, not on, you know, wandering around trying to work out who goes where and what does it actually look like. Okay, so the benefits of turn and talk when students build up ideas with a partner, they often learn new information from that person. No surprises. They also learn about that person and build relationships. Now, you know, everyone always asks for start of year activities to get to know everyone. Turn and talk. When people are sharing their opinions, you get to learn more about them and sharing their wonderings. Well, there's a great activity, authentic activity for building community in your classroom. No worksheets required. Nothing off teachers pay teachers required. Right, these relationships are especially important for English language learners who need many and varied opportunities to produce language. And this idea, the turn and talk, this is a safe space to, you know, to road test some of that language, to roll those words around on their own tongue and test them out with a peer. 
It's a lot less scary than, you know, having to answer out in front of the whole class. So uh, many shy students also build confidence as they talk with partners of various proficiency levels during the year. Turn and talk. It costs absolutely nothing, has enormous instructional benefits. So let's get more of it happening in our classrooms. When it comes to establishing expectations, you saw uh, on the far left, or actually the, the left in the middle, I've taken those from the video clip. That's the, they're the anchor charts to help the students to learn what are the expectations. An important part about this, well, I know we're in F2, right? So not everyone can read all of this lovely text. That's why they've got the illustrations next to it, just to prompt that thinking. Oh, yeah, what was the first step? What was the second step? Uh, this is also uh, message abundance. So in the EAL classroom, message abundance is giving students the message in lots of different ways. So we've got text here, we've got images here, and the more of this, uh, the more supportive it is for the EAL learner. On the right-hand side, thank you to Angela Collins for sending this in to me, uh, just another anchor chart that they've worked on as a class. This is how to effectively buzz so they must call it their turn and talk is obviously called a buzz. And they've, they've actually you can tell they've had this conversation. Now, I want to draw your attention to the fact these are not printed and laminated sheets. They're not, you know, off a website. These are co-constructed with the students. That is the most powerful form of learning. So the idea of an anchor chart, which is what the fancy word for a poster, the anchor chart pulls up the learning from that lesson. So when they see it, I think of it like a ship sailing across the water, when they see that poster on the wall, down goes the anchor and they pull it up and they go, oh, yeah, I remember what we talked about in that lesson. We need to do this, this and this. That's the whole idea of an anchor chart. If they've co-constructed it, if they were there in that lesson when that poster was being made, it's going to mean a lot more to them than one that's just printed off the internet and put on the wall that we never look at, okay? Right. The other way that we need to build capacity of our students to have these rich conversations is to give them some sentence stems so that they can, we can help them to structure their conversations. So I've got some sentence stems here. Sentence stems are, uh, you know, th you don't have to use all of them. In fact, I wouldn't use all of them in one go. These are sentence stems that students can use to agree with someone else's comment. Because remember, conversation's two ways. So I might give my idea, but a conversation isn't me giving my idea and then Cheryl giving her idea and then, you know, we're finished. It's I need to listen to Cheryl's idea and think to myself, oh, how does that, you know, how does that fit with my idea? Do I agree? Do I disagree? Can I build on? So that's what a conversation is. We're building, building a thought together. We're co-constructing a thought. So these sentence stems can help students to learn how to do that. Because remember, not all of our students come from a background where they're going to have this modelled for them at home. So by providing explicit instruction in this, we're enabling all students to have access to this strong modelling. So you might use sentence stems like, I agree with. Uh, interesting point. I think that. That's true. I agree. I also think I have to agree that. Now, with sentence stems, it's not enough just to, you know, print them out and put them in the middle of the room. Let's, let's model this in a fishbowl. Let's have all of the students sitting around while two people sit in the middle and model what this actually looks like. So I'll pull another person uh, sitting opposite me. I'll get a student. Paige can come and sit opposite me and we will have a conversation and I'll model how I use one of these sentence stems and then we'll go off and, and trial that in our own conversations. So with the sentence stems, they're temporary. They're just to build their capacity. When you can start hearing this in their own natural language, then we pull the sentence stems away. They're just a scaffold. We want it to be a natural conversation but this is a way to carry on the conversation. Uh, another way to carry on the conversation is to build on to someone else's ideas. Now, if you think about it, and I see someone in the chat earlier uh, reference that idea of this is what we're doing in guided reading. When we finish our, when the students have gone off and they've done their reading for guided reading, we pull them back together. We want to have a conversation about the text. And this is where we can practice these skills in that small environment. Of course, we can also practice these uh, in partners, on, you know, in the whole group. So lots of opportunities. But again, we've got to teach the students the stems that they can use to build on. Because out in the real world, this is what we do naturally when we're out, you know, with our mates, 
conversation goes a little bit quiet. Uh, we've got to work out, well, how can I keep this conversation going? Well, here are some sentence stems for us to, to use. Don't just use these. Ask the students for things in their own words as well that you could add. This could be another anchor chart. Uh, here's some setting exp an example of setting expectations for presentational talk. So Andrea sent this to me, learning how to give a good book talk. So this is a bit of, it's almost a bit of a waggle wall, what a good one looks like, yeah? So prepare, these are the things you need to do to prepare. These are the things you need to do when you're presenting. Keep it short, I like that one. That teacher's sat through way too many boring book talks. That's why they've got that one on there. <laughs> so being really explicit. And of course, this anchor chart by itself isn't enough. We need to actually model. Watch what I do as I give a book talk and then you're going to have a practice making one. Now, the talk, what are we talking about? Well, it makes sense that we talk about texts because remember, literature is one of the parts of the speaking and listening curriculum. So uh, here, my suggestions for you are to find a text that has opportunity for some rich and deep discussion. I've put a picture of uh, Bob Graham's book, Let's Get a Pup. I just think all of Bob's Graham, Bob Graham books are so relatable, particularly in that F2 environment. So uh, it's hard to get through one of his books without making at least one connection. So select a picture storybook uh, to use to get that discussion going. Know the book yourself. You have to have read the book. You cannot yank one off the shelf and start reading it and then just think that you're going to come up with some amazing question that kids can talk about. You have to have read the book first, okay? My third dot point here is to pre-plan your questions. So thinking in advance before you've got all the little rugrats sitting in front of you rolling around, what would be a question that could elicit some deep thinking that is related to this text? Your questions that you plan beforehand will be far better than the ones that you plan on the fly. I can tell you that much from personal experience, lots of it. Uh, so think about those questions. Try and go for the why and how questions. So uh, even, so for Let's Get a Pup, I mean, as I said, his books are relatable. We're going to talk about, we, you, we might look at the front cover and we might think about predicting. Now, usually what we do is we say, oh, let's look at the front cover. What do we think this book might be about? And we ask one, that one question gets put over to the students and one student answers. This is the perfect opportunity to do a turn and talk. That is then, so you've now got 100% of your kids actually thinking about that question you've just asked. So rather than saying, oh, I wonder what this book's about, who thinks they can, you know, what, what predictions would you like to make about this book? Turn and talk to your partner and don't forget to say why. Predicting, you always got to say why you make that prediction. And then your job as a teacher is to listen. What are they saying? Are there predictions? You know, what are you learning about their ability to predict by listening to their conversations as they turn and talk? It's just such a simple uh, instructional move that will really up the ante in terms of who's doing the work and the thinking in the classroom. And my final bit of advice for using picture storybooks for discussion is don't be afraid to reread the same book a bazillion times and pull it out for when you're teaching reading and pull it out again for when you're teaching writing. It's totally fine to refer to Bob Graham as Bob because you've read his book so many times, all right? So we want to say, oh, what does Bob Graham do here? What's Bob doing here? Um, I've put this book up here because on my website, that's I, you can see on the right-hand side, I've ticked the things that I think this book would be useful for teaching in, in terms of comprehension. So hopefully I've ticked, oh good, I've ticked predicting because I've just said it was good for predicting. And I've also said I would use this book in years F to four. So if you want more books like that, you know where to go. Okay, questioning. Let's talk about teacher questioning for a minute. Uh, this is something I really love to bang on about. Right, this quote. An average teacher asks 400 questions each day. And I always say, imagine if you got paid per question. Ka-ching! Roughly 70,000 questions each year or two to three million over a teaching career. Do you, is that something that resonates for you? Is that true? Is the data, you know, reflective of what's happening for you? That means teachers spend a third of their time asking questions. Yet most of the questions teachers pose are answered in less than a second. The average time that we wait before accepting an answer 
calling on someone else or answering the question themselves. So there's a lot to think about with teacher questioning. And I always say, when I was in university, we had to do a whole shoot on this, 50 whole minutes on questioning. I just used to think, what a waste of 50 minutes. You know, what are you going to talk about for 48 minutes? It's going to take two minutes to say, how do you ask a question? How wrong was I? This questioning is so much broader than a 50-minute shoot. It is something that you are just constantly honing over your entire career. I had no idea the importance of effective questioning. Good questioning isn't necessarily about asking lots of questions. That's one of my key learnings. It's about asking the right question and asking it in the right way or the most effective way, okay? So I'm going to share some of my learnings with you about effective teacher questioning. The first is you have to pre-plan your questions. Now, I talked about that when I was looking at the Bob Graham book. Why do you have to pre-plan your questions is because when you're in the heat of the moment, these brilliantly rich questions that elicit deep discussion don't just flow to your head for some reason. It's very annoying. You have to pre-plan them. You've got to think in advance. What do I want the kids to talk about? What do I want them to think about in this lesson? That's what I'm going to ask them a question about. Focus on the why and the how questions because these are the ones that get the kids to dig deeper into their brain when you ask them, okay? Now this, this is a big one. Ask one question and give it space. All right, so what, does, what, what on earth am I on about? Ask one question and give it space. This is what I see happen in lots of classrooms. Well, let's start with my own classroom. I was totally guilty of this. What happens is, and usually if we haven't pre-planned the question, this is, it happens. If we've come up with a question, what can happen is we can ask the question to the students. So who, you know, how has this character changed through the text? And as we ask the question, we convince ourselves that the kids aren't going to be able to answer it. Oh, goodness me, that's a hard question. And so what we end up doing is we, end, we throw in six other questions. So watch what happens. This is what it looks like. Who thinks they, you know, who would like to talk about how the characters changed during the text? So what were they like at the start? You know, so what, and then what, how did their character, how did their face change in the middle? And then what did they look like at the end? So, you know, and, and then think about this. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? We throw six questions out there. We don't let our first one, we need to throw the first one out and just let it land and give it space. And we will see by the responses that we get, whether we need to give extra supports. If we've pre-planned our question, we're less likely to need seven other follow-up questions because we've thought deeply about the right question and we've worded it in such a way they're going to understand it. So rather than diving in and saving our kids and giving them all of these extra supports before we even need, know that they need it, ask the question and just let it sit. And listen, listen for the student responses. And if you see, well, they are totally not getting this, then yes, you can start to add in some uh, additional supports, but stop doing the work for them, all right? Of course, can't talk about questioning without wait time. This goes with the previous suggestion of, letting, of giving it space. And the, the quote that we looked at, too often we are rewarding the fastest thinkers in our classroom. So when we ask a question, that whole, the think pair share, that think part, we have to value that because we're sending a message to our students that deep thinking is valuable. I'm going to give you the time to think deeply about this. If we're not providing wait time, we're telling our kids that fastest thinking is good thinking. And it's, that's not necessarily the case. You know, when I've, we've got a global pandemic and we've got our, someone leading the whole country, I don't want that person just coming up with ideas off the top of their head. I want them to think deeply. So we've got to teach that skill right in F2. So providing wait time. And it's not 100, you know, it's just a couple of seconds. And too often I see students in the class who have tuned out because they know those four kids are going to answer this thing anyway. So I don't even need to think about it. I'll just wait until they answer it. And they do. Those four kids, they put their hand up, they answer it, we all move on. 
So if you provide wait time, it is it allows everyone to at least have a go at thinking, yeah, what do I think about that? Okay, more inclusive. Use turn and talk to build confidence. This turn and talk is just so valuable. If you ask a question, you know those times when you ask a question and you just get crickets, like no one's given you anything back and you stand there thinking, oh, no. That is the perfect time to do a turn and talk. So when you ask a question and no one's got anything for you, turn and talk because it allows kids to road test. They think, oh, I've got an idea. It's not fully formed and I'm definitely not sharing it to the whole group, but I will just share it to this person sitting next to me. I'll test it out. I'll see if we're sort of on the same wavelength before I have the confidence to share it to the bigger group, okay? So if you get crickets, use a turn and talk and then try it again to the whole group. Expect full sentence responses. So uh, I often, when I do observations in classrooms, I'll write a transcript of what the teacher says and what the students say. And too often, the student transcript is full of one word answers. No, yes, because, you know, Sundays, Mondays, whatever. We need to demand higher thinking from our students. We need full sentences. So I've got to put, because what we do, they give us a one word answer and then we put it into a nice long sentence for them. We do, we are doing the work. So I've got to put it back onto them. We have to do less of the work. So can you tell me that in a full sentence, please? Can you start that with this or give them a sentence stem uh, when, you're, when they're going to respond? And my final tip is to be conscious of the IRE pattern of response. Let me explain this. You probably, if you've been to any of the BASTO courses for literacy, you'll be familiar with the IRE. IRE is the teacher asks a question, initiates a question, so how's the character changed during the text? We wait to a few kids put up their hand and someone responds and then we evaluate. So we say, who would like to say how the character changes during the text? Uh, Isaac puts up his hand and he says uh, she was happy at the start and then she was sad at the end. And then we say, great, Isaac. So we've given him, yep, a tick or a cross. Uh, and then we ask another question. You know, this is, you know what I'm talking about, the IRE response? So this is, research shows this is the most common response or the most common default pattern in our classrooms. It doesn't say that you can't ever use this, so don't walk away thinking that. It is a problem if it's the only uh, form of discussion that you have in your classroom. So the impact of IRE on EAL learners and on other learners Compared to the traditionally tightly controlled IRE exchange, a dialogic approach, is, which is where we get more kids talking, offers EL students or English language learner students an increase in comprehensible input since there'll be far more opportunities to have ideas clarified and revisited. In addition, there'll be many more opportunities for students to engage in using the language, i.e. doing the work. Okay, so then they can produce more extended, reasoned contributions and learn how to interact and collaborate with peers, which also sounds like a lifelong skill, doesn't it? Now, this I'm just going to say this, that this is not someone else's diagram here. This is how I visualise it. I think we need to have less ping pong matches in our classrooms. So let me explain because everyone's thinking we don't even play ping pong in our classroom. When you use the IRE pattern, I think of it as a teacher hits a ping pong ball over the net and there's all the kids sitting on the other side of the net. If you are only using the IRE, the teacher hits the ball across, one student hits the ball back. The teacher hits the ball across again, they ask another question and a different student hits the ball back. So if we've got a class of 25 kids, you know, two kids have been able to respond 23 kids are sitting there not having thought or spoken potentially in that lesson. So I think we need to be conscious of, well, I am engaged in a ping pong match right here and this needs to stop. I at least need to turn it into a volleyball match. Now, I don't know much about volleyball, but my primary school teacher, Mr Knight, said that you had to hit it. I think you had to hit it three or four times over the other side. So I think, or maybe for inclusion, you made us do it six times, right? So we had to hit it over the net. And then three different players had to touch the ball before it came back over. So think about that in terms of class discussion. Teacher throws a question out and at least three different kids 
if not all of them, have a go at responding to it before it comes back and you ask another one. I don't know if that is helpful or not, but that's just how I visualise it when I'm in the classroom. I think it's because I used to watch too much Ally McBeal and she did too much of that visualising. I don't know. <laughs> so there you go. More volleyball or turn and talk, less ping, less ping pong. Now, the final part of assessment, uh, final part of speaking is I want to talk about this idea of assessment because I, you know, as I said, lots of people say, oh, has anyone got any assessments for speaking and listening? Speaking and listening there is so broad and for some reason we devalue teacher observation. What you hear with your ears is the best assessment going around and we have devalued that. We feel like we need some external test to tell us whether our kids are good at this or not. If we know the curriculum, if we deeply understand the expectations in the curriculum, we can constantly be looking out and listening for what are their skills in each of these areas. So I like Richard Ellington's work. He's uh, got a book called What Struggling Readers Really Need or something along those lines. And he said, um, out in the real world, when he's talking about books, I don't ask questions to test you, but help me. So I think the same in the classroom. We've got to be conscious of the types of questions that we're asking. We're not testing their knowledge, but every time we get a que an answer back, that's data for us. That is, did they understand the question? It's data about, do they know how to respond to questions? Uh, do they, uh, did they understand the text? Do they understand the social norms? Did they, uh, what's their level of comprehension? You learn so much about students through listening to their responses. So uh, there's a difference between hearing and listening. We really have to listen hard and hear what they've got to say. And that is the assessment that we need. That's the most effective assessment. All right, told you I was a bit passionate about speaking. Now, I'm not gonna talk about the others for so long, so you'd be pleased to hear that. I am going to give you three minutes just to, just to pause and do a reflection to say, well, so what? You know, out of everything that I've talked about tonight for speaking, how does that uh, influence you? What are you thinking? What aligned with your thinking? And maybe what tweaks are you going to commit to in your own classroom? So I'll leave you and I'll be back in two and, two and a bit minutes.
Okay, everyone, thank you. It's great to see your reflections in the chat. I really do appreciate being able to read those. I can see a few of you are going to be focusing on wait time and providing space. And if you do it, I want to know how it goes. So contact me on the, uh, on, at Auslet Teacher and I want, I want to hear what the difference is. You'll see how often you do it. It's so frustrating, but it's such an easy thing to change and to, get, to make a big impact. Okay, let's talk about listening. Did you think I wasn't going to talk about gradual release again? This is another one. We don't ever use gradual release. How often have you actually explicitly taught your students about listening? We do a lot of, uh, it's a bit like behaviour management sometimes. You know how sometimes we teach them by constantly telling them what not to do? Well, listening's, you know, I think that's how we've been teaching it for so long. We give them a long list of things. Don't do this, don't do that. So we need to start filling their brains with all of the right things or all of the most effective things for listening. So uh, what does that look like? It's pretty much the same process as speaking. So we've got to set our expectations. And again, we want to have that idea of message abundancy. So we want our students to visually be able to see it. We want to model it for them. We want to fishbowl it so that they can, you know, when we've got the kids around the outside and us modeling or um, acting in the middle. This is a post, an anchor chart. I watched a class, I observed a lesson at Wyndham Park Primary School. Hello, teachers there. Uh, great foundation lesson. These kids were 20 days into their schooling lives and they were sh pretty schmick because they'd spent time really embedding expectations around what happens in the literacy block. So 20, you would never have known they were only 20 days into school. And in this lesson, this anchor chart was demonstrated and they were talking about the expectations of the students in modelled reading and the teacher had drawn this um, very teachery <laughs> illustration. Uh, and a quick turn and talk, what do you notice about the student in this image? So rather than saying, now, this is how we do it. We have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this. It's a simple turn and talk. What do you notice? So then the students are able to notice, oh, they've got their eyes facing on the book. Oh, their brain is thinking about the book. Oh, the teacher's reading out the story. Oh, they're facing the front, you know, all of these things. You can see what you notice. Um, and I must say, one of the students noticed that the student didn't have any ears, a little oversight by the teacher. So she had to quickly add on some ears because otherwise they couldn't hear the story. But the main point about this is that the expectations are clear. And yes, it took a lesson to set them up, but it's going to set them up for much faster, more on time and on track learning for the rest of the year. Not to say this is set and forget. You can't just do one lesson at the start of the year and we're all, you know, totally tuned into effective listening. We've got to come back to it, but at least we've had the mini lesson. At least we've got the anchor chart so we can say, oh, how do we look like this poster, this anchor chart over here? Other anchor charts, uh, active listening. What does it look, sound and feel like? Let's be explicit about this. Uh, sounds like I listen quietly, I ask and I answer questions. It feels like I understand, I know what's going on. And then on the right-hand side down the bottom, thank you, Kirby, for sending this in, partner talk. It doesn't have to be some crazy elaborate anchor chart. This is, uh, I, think, I think this is actually a photo of a whiteboard and they've had a discussion around the expectations of partner talk, even if it's just a reminder. Remember what we said in that lesson about partner talk? What did we have to do? And it says there, eye contact, nod your head, because... That's what we do in the real world, isn't it? When someone's talking, we sort of nod to let them know, especially if we're on webinars or Zoom or whatever, or nodding to say, yep, I'm getting what you're saying. I'm, uh, pick, I'm getting, getting I'm on the train with you. So uh, asking questions, and I like the bit, you can't really see it, it's a bit small, but it says, look interested. <laughs> so uh, I think that's an important one, especially um, for your husband, just after a long day at work, need to at least look interested in what I'm saying or, you know, what everyone else is saying. Okay, uh, here, more expectations. So when we teach listening, these are some things to consider. You practice facing them with your whole body. What does that mean? You know, so you don't, you're not off to the side where, look, our body is saying, I am interested in what you're saying. We, mod we model and we show that we're smiling and that we're nodding and that we're doing all of these uh, things that we do out in the real world. And I think too often we assume that students know these and especially for those students who are on the spectrum this stuff needs to be explicitly taught these little cues that we just do 
uh, that we th assume that everyone just does, we've got to pull them apart and say, this is, you know, we do nodding, we smile, and we smile to show the reader that we get what they're saying. Or it's another way of saying, I agree, or I think what you're saying is funny or enjoyable. So there's all these little messages that our body is sending that we've got to be explicit about. Give negative versions. Don't kids love this when you model and say, okay, what am I doing wrong? What, you know, what can you see here if we're rolling around on the floor while someone's trying to talk to us? So they can see what it is and what it isn't really clearly. All right? And they always love doing that, that acting. Model listening with the purpose of getting the gist of what someone is saying. So too much of, particularly in the F2 where we're so egocentric, well, our students are, uh, they, um, they, uh, their conversation is, okay, everyone listen to me and then I'm done. Thank you. Don't need to listen to any of you because I've said my bit. So we've got to practice listening to the other person and finding out what they have to say. And then we can start to think about well, what does that mean for me and my thinking, all right? Model appropriate listening responses. So if someone's telling you something, besides nodding and smiling and all those non-verbal cues, we also do things like we say, oh, right, yeah, oh, uh-huh, yep, okay. It's a bit like when I'm on the phone to my younger sister, I'll be, I think there was an ad on um, telly years ago, that cockatoo that goes, oh, right, it's just on a repeat. So, you know, there are things that we do out in the real world that we need to teach our kids how to do uh, to carry out natural conversations. Now... This is a skill that clarifying, so, you know, I talked about sentence stems earlier. I love this illustration of it over on the right-hand side. This is from that Zwyers and Hamler book. So you can see that speaker one is talking about a dog and speaker two is saying, oh, so hang on, which type of dog? And speaker three is saying this specific type. They're clarifying, okay? So in the research, uh, it's suggested that particularly if you have EAL learners, Teaching clarifying is a really important skill for them because they're going to spend a lot of their time needing to use that skill, right? Because they're going to need to clarify. I'm not quite sure what you're saying there. Can you help me understand this a little more? So here are some sentence stems to help students to clarify. Uh, sorry, I don't understand the bit where you said this. Uh, what do you mean when you say this? How could you explain this? How, have I got it right? You think this. So the, this is another skill that we don't always uh, explicitly teach our students, but particularly for our, our EAL students, maybe even before we're teaching them how to add and build on, this clarifying piece is the piece that this is what we start with. It also teaches our students to listen, all right? So another one that teaches our students to listen is when we teach paraphrasing. So paraphrasing is what well, forces you to hear what that other person has to say. So when that other person's speaking, we've got to be thinking, okay, okay, yep, they're saying this, they're saying this, they're saying this. So it then enables us to say, okay, well, I think what you're saying is this. It's a really hard skill actually, but it really lifts that accountability of listening, okay? So here are a couple of sentence stems. So what you're saying is, I think you said... And again, that beautiful illustration on the right-hand side, message abundancy, to show our kids, to visualise what does it look like? What does it mean to paraphrase? So small and quick, very effective teacher tip. When you do your turn and talk, when you ask the students to share back or when you've done your think, pair, share, you can say at the end of this conversation, I'm going to ask you to report back what your partner said, not what you said, what your partner said. And it absolutely flips their focus of what I'm talking about and how amazing my idea is to, oh goodness, I've got to listen to them because I've got to report back what they've said at the end. One of the benefits of this sharing back what your partner said is, is that those voices in the classroom that don't get heard very often, this is an opportunity for them to be heard. So either their voice gets heard or their ideas get heard because the person working with them says, oh, this is what, uh, you know, this is what Marty had to say, so their idea gets heard, or they can report back their partner's, their partner's response and it gives them confidence to know they're not going to be judged for the response. That it's their partner's response. So it's less scary to report that back. But, oh, my goodness, does it shoot up the accountability for listening in the classroom? Yes. Okay. 
a teacher move to increase listening accountability in the classroom? This is an easy one, but oh my goodness, this is so prevalent, all right? We need a vaccination for this. We talked about IRE, remember this? Initiate, respond, evaluate. Teacher asks the question, one student responds, the teacher evaluates. What, what we do, us well-meaning teachers, with the best of intention, is we add in a repeat answer, all right? So what it looks like is this. Can anyone tell me how the character has changed during the book? And then Isaac puts up his hand and says, she was sad at the start, she was happy at the end. And you know what we do? We go, oh, Isaac, so she was happy at the start and she was sad at the end. Yeah. And so what we've done is we've said to every other kid in that classroom, don't listen to what Isaac says, I'm going to repeat it. So I'm going to say it out loud, okay? Can you see what happens there? It also increases the amount of times that I talk as opposed to the students talk because I'm going to talk, I'm going to ask the question, a student's going to respond and I'm going to repeat their answer for them and then I'm going to evaluate it. So I've got three talk moves to one. Now, the other thing that it does, and you'll see in the speaking and listening curriculum, students need to learn to speak with appropriate volume. So one of the reasons that we repeat their answer is because we think, well, that was so quiet no one else in the room is going to have heard that, so I better repeat it back for them. And so what we're doing, oh, I hate to even use the term because I, ugh, mum used to say it to us all the time and I hate it, we're doing a false rescue, all right? She'll be so happy that I had to mention it. False rescue is when we save them. They don't need saving. We need to make them do the work. So if, there is, if we ask a question and Isaac mumbles his response or he says it really quietly, he knows I'm going to repeat it for him. He doesn't need to use a big voice. So rather than me repeating it, I need to say, oh, Sarah, could, did you hear what Isaac had to say? And Sarah will say, oh, no, I didn't. Oh, Isaac, you'll need to repeat it. So we're building their capacity to change and vary their voice, the level of their voice. Do you see what I'm saying? Otherwise, we are res false rescuing, yes, mum, false rescuing them all of the time. We're not building their independence. So, and... We're saying to the rest of the kids, you don't need to listen to anyone's response on the floor because I'm always going to repeat it. So we need them to listen. When someone gives a response, we want them to almost turn to that student and listen to what they've got to say, not listen to my repeating of it. Do you, I'd love to see if people are, um, if this is resonating. When you go back into the classroom tomorrow, you will be shocked at how often you accidentally repeat a, re a student's response. Now, there are times when you do need to do it. So you, Usually, if, you know, if a student has given a response and the syntax is incorrect, it's just a really quick and easy way to pop in the right syntax. So actually, one of the boys in that video, he used an overgeneralization of a rule. So that would be the perfect example. So uh, like, you know, when someone says, um, he runned over the girl, and then you can go, oh, okay, so he ran over the girl. You know, just that simple, you don't need to make a song and dance about it, but you're presenting the right syntax but you will be shocked at just how often you repeat responses. And it's just get rid of the repeat and that pushes the accountability back onto the students. You're welcome. All right, two minutes to reflect and then we're going to have a six-minute whirlwind tour of vocabulary. Let's do it. I'll see you in two minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. Okay, we've made an executive decision here at the Basto HQ. I have too much goods and goodness to talk about in terms of vocabulary. So we're actually going to pause rather than rush through it and not do it justice. We're going to put it at the start of the next webinar. I hope everyone's okay with that because there's some really meaty and valuable learning in that and we're not going to do it justice in three minutes. So I'm hoping that you're fine with it. So having said that, quickly turn your eyes away while I skip up to the very end of the presentation. Don't look anyone. <laughs> All right, here we are. I want to talk about to you, just to finish off, talk about the resources. Where can you go? We've, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of speaking and listening tonight. So first, go to the Fuse, the Debt Fuse website to, you can, you know, as I said, download the previous webinars and the supporting resources packs. Here they are here. If you are interested in learning more, reading more about speaking and listening, here are three of the resources that I would recommend. Scaffolding Language, Scaffolding Learning. Uh, the Zweiers and Hamler book, that's in the middle, that's the K to 3 book. That is very practical. The first one's very theory. The second one's very practical. And the third one by Maria Nichols, Building Bigger Ideas. She's talking about building uh, conversations and she is a junior teacher as well. So I think that's a good mix, actually, of theory and practical. So there's three books. Don't worry if you didn't get them written down because we'll send out a copy of the slides so you'll be able to uh, access those or the names of those. One thing I just did want to make reference to is uh, the purpose of tonight wasn't to talk about speech difficulties, but if you do have concerns with students in terms of speaking and listening in your classroom, the department has a range of resources for you to go to for further learning and support. So these will, all of these links will be on the slides get, that get sent out to you so you can potentially use those as assistance. Uh, there's an auditory processing assessment kit that has been, that is now available to schools. Uh, so that's something to look out for. Oral language course, that's from the inclusive classrooms. So uh, the applications for term two courses open this coming Monday and the final one I've put there, are you familiar with the ARC website, the website you go to, the department's website for the uh, access to professional development sessions? If you're not, get onto it. But they do have um, some auditory processing professional development sessions available on there, actually quite a few. So uh, that's another place that you can go to to build your own knowledge bank around um, assisting students with speaking and listening. Okay, just to finish off, the understanding goals were that you build your understanding of the theory that underpins speaking and listening. Didn't get to vocab. Too much speaking. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, well, I'm going to blame the technical difficulties at the start. I'm sure I would have nailed it all otherwise. Deepen their understanding of a range of effective teaching practices. I hope that particularly the speaking part tonight was really practical for you. And I know that if you make those small tweaks to your teaching, it'll pay enormous dividends in student learning. And I want to hear about it. So uh, finally, you've reflected on your own practice. So here's the success criteria. Can you outline the speaking and listening expectations? Were you surprised by them? Hmm, interesting. You can identify a range of teaching practices and strategies and reflect on the literacy teaching and learning practices in your classroom or school. Before you leave tonight, I would love you to put in the Padlet your one takeaway from tonight's session. Otherwise, I will see you, hopefully I'll be back in the flesh at the Basto building again. Uh, we're going to talk about all things phonological awareness and now vocab in the next session. So thanks for joining us tonight, everyone. I will see you 